Thank you very much, and, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a real honor to, to be asked to speak at, the, at this Augusta, uh, these old halls. Um, uh, I'm uh, involved in, in some practical farming. We, we, we run a, uh, we milk about 15,000 cows and, and, and export about 20,000 tons of pumpkins a year out of New Zealand through that business on the right, through the business on the, on the left, sorry. The business on the right, we, um, we, uh, we planted about 6,500 hectares of carbon forestry. We're the biggest dedicated carbon forester in New Zealand. Uh, and we've done both of those businesses, both with our own capital, but with, with substantial international money that we've brought into New Zealand. So we're responsible for a quarter of a billion New Zealand dollars worth of equity funds under management. We borrow a bit of money from the bank, and we, we run about $400 million worth of, of farming assets in New Zealand and forestry. The, the business in the middle is, is, is a database which we've spun off from Map of Agriculture. When I first started going around the world raising money for New Zealand farming, uh, I used to look into the eyes of the, of the potential limited partner and, and, and I used to see this, I used to see what he was thinking, which was, I like what that guy's saying, but I bet there's some land in Kazakhstan where you can do it a lot cheaper. And, and you know, nowhere in the world could we find a database that could tell us whether that was the case. So we, we just built it. And so um, what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna give you a wee outsider's view of, of Irish farming um, from that database. I'm going to just give you a two-slide summary of what, what as, as, a, as a farming group, we think is our responsibilities with respect to climate change. I'm going to summarize some on-farm climate smart initiatives that we uh, are trying to, we call our fund manager Craig more sustainable, so we take this stuff pretty seriously. Um, and then I'm going to skip over some quite technical slides that I've written because we're just not going to have time to get through them and, and enjoy our evening. The most important thing is to get discussion going, not for me to hit you over the head with a whole lot of mathematics. So I've put my business cards there, and anybody who wants the, the more mathematical stuff about what is the amount of hectares of trees you need to grow to fully defease the carbon or nitrous oxide or methane from some ruminant animals, that's, that's in those, that's section four. And then we're going to have a look at the, at the price of Coca-Cola and milk in the high street here in Dublin, and then we're going to talk about sheep. So... Um, uh, we actually have been researching, so far we haven't brought any land other than in New Zealand, but we've, we've we tried to buy land in Australia and they drove us away. And we've tried to buy land in East Germany and we couldn't get comfortable with it. And we, um, we, 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 we brought our best analyst over, a young guy who was an outstanding farm acquiring guy in New Zealand. We said, come on, find opportunities in Irish and, and, um, and, and English and, and Scottish agriculture. Where, where's, where, where's the opportunities? And uh, annoyingly, we couldn't find any opportunities here in Ireland. Uh, our conclusion was that um, it's a great place to farm, it's good infrastructure, but it, we just didn't find a lot of opportunities to bring, say, New Zealand farming techniques to this country, because frankly, you're already farming very well here. Uh, there's a very, good, uh, a very good advisory community, good spread of best practice. So for an investor, it, it was just harder to find opportunities. Um, we, we, we are becoming aware here in, in, in Scotland and in Ireland and a couple of other European countries, there's a lot of talk about um, government sort of support of the farming sector to, to get out of beef and into dairy and all this sort of thing. And that concerns us. In New Zealand we've had experience of governments picking winners, winners it seldom works out well. And um, th there's some environmental constraints simply because of the lack of cheap land. So let's have a quick look at this database. So Missouri. And let's have a look at the profitability of that over time. And what we'll see is that um, operational returns have been pretty disappointing. And this is the characteristic of beef farming all around the world, in including, as I understand it, here in Ireland. Um, pretty low profitability per hectare, EBIT. And um, production levels of um, about you know, 100, 150 kilograms per hectare, which is not atypical. Go to a European country, and we'll see that beef in, say, Germany is also generating pretty disappointing, with very low returns, even lower for the owner-operator who's making a loss, and the landlord is making about 1%. So 
So there's a very ordinary farming sector that hasn't performed very well. I happen to think it's about to have its, its good times again for a few years because all of these agricultural commodities go in cycles, but uh, it, it, it isn't an easy one. There's one, this is a very valuable database the European Commission put together, and we're about to have a look at all the Irish data, which is why I wanted to look at some American and some German data before we did. But there's one thing you have to understand about this database, and that is the wages of management are imputed. So a small farm where the small farmer is prepared to work long hours just because he loves the lifestyle, his salary will be imputed at a, at a full salary, and, and so he'll often appear to make a loss, although he doesn't think he is. Let's have a look at Ireland now. Okay, here we are. Beef, um, well, let's have a look at dairy first. Let's have a look at um, grains, just, just for a change. So we have a look at grains here in Ireland. So um, operational returns per hectare of around about 400 euros. Now, since the European subsidy is just over 200 euros a hectare, that's, those operational returns to the farmer are roughly half subsidy. This is the average person. I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that are not, that are not the average. Uh, but um, this is the average from the European database. And that means that that grain farmer is making about a 1% return on this capital here. That's the total capital he has employed in that, in that farm. So that's how we, we look at farming when we, we bring up all that data and we try and look at its, its economics. Let's have a look at um, dairy farming here in Ireland. Uh, it is it is growing about five uh, 550 from uh, 450 kilograms of milk solids per hectare per year. Multiply that by uh, 12. That's about um, six six and a half thousand liters of milk uh, per hectare per year. This is your average farmer. And again, very similar profitability to your grain farming, uh, but um, probably a bit more reliable and um, operating at you know, a 1.5% return. One of the things that we found very interesting when we looked at the data was that your landlord's returns have been going down. Rents have been going down from 400 a hectare to, to 300 a hectare. And the owner-operator, he's still capitalising his... The, sorry, the operator, the tenant, he's still capitalising his labour at a cheap rate and giving away labour for free, but it's, it's getting less bad and he's starting to get a better return. So we, we just... We can see some interesting trends. We think there's a lot of stability there. Let's compare Irish dairy farming with, say, Australian. Let's have a look at the... Let's have a look at, I don't know, Queensland. And there we can see, you know... The average farmer in Queensland is growing 200 kilograms. You know, Ireland's doing four or 500. So a much better place to farm. Let's have a look at probably the most comparable farming sector to you lot, and that is the west of the UK. And there they are generating very similar returns per hectare. Very similar but they're getting a higher operational return because their total assets is um, only about 60% of yours. So you, you're capitalising, and, and it is a great place to farm in the UK, and, and these chaps have TB, which you, you've substantially got on top of. But, um, you know, th those are the comparatives. So we would, you know, as a, as a sort of professional investor in farmland, we would say the west of England's a great place to farm, Ireland's a great place to farm, both of them are fully priced. But nevertheless, fantastic farming industries. I, I now, this is what I do when I'm trying to raise money from investors. I now go to New Zealand and I go to a, an ordinary place in New Zealand like the Waikato where they don't have irrigation. And there they are doing just under 1,000 kilograms of milk solids per hectare per year. Instead of doing 400 euros, they're doing an average of about 1,500 to 2,000 of cash flow, and they're making operating returns on capital of about 5.4%, even though capital is similar to, to your capital per hectare here. It's a large amount of money that we pay for farms in New Zealand. We actually have all our farms in Canterbury. We're quite keen about irrigation. We're going to debate that later. Um, uh, but we, in Canterbury, we're, we're able to grow about a tonne and a half of milk solids per hectare per year, 
and cash flow averages about $3,000 a hectare. Uh, the capital value of those assets is pretty high, but you're still able to throw off cash at around about a 7.3% rate. So that's, that's a quick survey of, 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 of some good, solid places to do dairy farming, the west of England, Ireland, some new world places. America is very similar to New Zealand, by the way. Uh, let's have a quick look at that, and then we'll get off this database. Dairy farming in a place like, say, Minnesota is um, been very profitable the last 10 years, making around about a 5% return, and, um, but, but, much, but on a much more extensive scale. Similar type of production per hectare to, to here. More grain fed, of course. Right, so that's a quick survey of um, sort of the context, if you like, of, of Irish beef and dairy farming. Let's have a now have, go back to my presentation. And this is any questions. Um, and we concluded it was, you know, dairy farming here is about the same as crop, much better than beef. Good production levels and reliability. Very good productivity gains, I didn't point that out. About 3.5% per year, per hectare. That gets capitalised. That's, 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 that's showing the, the quality of the advisory and the, and the technical work being done in this country. Um, operator returns rising and landlord returns falling. Quick, quick summary of climate change, just two slides. So the atmosphere wraps the earth in a 20 kilometer thick blanket. Only 0.4% of this, it used to be 0.3%, is, is CO2. We need to get that down to 0.35%. That's a reduction in, in one meter's worth of, of, of CO2. That's about uh, 10 or 15 gigatons per uh, per year that we need to somehow take out of the atmosphere. And I'm going to argue quite briefly, because I'm going to run out of time quite soon, that forestry is, is one of mankind's most cost-effective tools in, in that fight. And it could be interesting for, for you here in Ireland, although I know at the, until 2020 you can't actually use forestry as a mitigant here in, in, in Irish agriculture. So this stuff over here on the left... Is, is the stuff that McKinsey, when they did this big study, said was, um, I, I'm gonna, I'll email you this presentation, said was, um, was, was had negative costs. You know, it, was, it, was, it was a gain to society to make our cars hybrid and, and insulate our houses. This is really where, where agriculture plays its role. Reduce slash and burn agriculture, reduce pastoral land conversion, grassland management, degraded <coughs> land restoration, pasture land deforestation. That gives us, takes us from about 10 gigatons to about 25 gigatons. And it's very cost effective, between 5 and 10 euros per ton. So, uh, uh, according to McKinsey, and I fully agree with him, forestry and better land management has a massive role to play in, in combating uh, climate change. Let's have a look at what we can do on our farms. This is some research from, the, from uh, the, uh, one of the Crown Research Institutes in New Zealand. It's an excellent paper, and it's referenced... It's footnoted in here. It's, it's a Bible of, of how to get your dairy cows to, make, to, to produce less methane. Um, their conclusion was, if we can, we can take our carbon intensity down from 12 kilograms of, of uh, CO2 per kilogram of milk solids down to about nine, simply by increasing production per, per cow. Uh, farm infrastructure, management skill, off-farm grazing, uh, feed pad, uh, barning in the winter, pasture and animal genetics. Soil sequestration also has potential. Uh, there's some very well documented uh, material on taking, going from arable systems, which when you have continuous cropping arable, you'll be down at about 2% soil organic matter unless you have exceptional peat soils. If you, if you're, if you're continuous cropping clay lands, you'll, you'll do what the eastern counties of the UK are rapidly heading towards, which is 2% organic matter. You, you will get your organic matter back up to 7% within 10 years. But it's a one-off gain. Um, uh, although after that one-off gain, you've got a lot, you, you can still each year make a difference. Pasture and feed management also helps a lot. We think Ireland's probably ahead of New Zealand in this respect. You here in Ireland have had uh, nitrate legislation for a lot longer than we have, 10 or 15 years. We've had it in New Zealand for three years, and it's radically changing New Zealand farming practices. As you do here in Ireland, we will soon be having a lot more feed pads, more winter barns, and protecting 
our soils in the winter, which is when we get the most loss of nitrates into the waterways and into the atmosphere. Some interesting work being done on plantain and chicory uh, in terms of pasture and feed management. Uh, and it looks like they, they both significantly reduce the greenhouse gases coming out of, out of, the, out of the rumen. Bioengineering of the cow has potential. It's actually not my area of expertise. I think it's going to be very interesting. It might take a long time. But, uh, so what's, 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 what's the possible strategy that, that uh, developed country and, and developing country agricultural sectors might start to adopt? Um, clearly feed pads and winter barns. Uh, clearly regulated and well-defined uh, fertilizer use with, with a high degree of extension and training around the time of application of fertilizer. Managing to hire grazing residuals uh, on each grazing round, increasing soil carbon and uh, nutrient fertilizer uptake through deeper roots, so, so building the soils. Um, and, and might these techniques all together contribute maybe 30% of headroom? They don't, they'll never get us to, to a carbon neutral cow, but we might, we might create some significant headroom. Um, then maybe we could offset some of the needed headroom with forestry. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, and, uh, and then see if we can come up with some technology. So the numbers on cows, and this is what I promised I'm not going to go through. The numbers on cows, are, when you really boil it down and do all the math, um, if you want to make that cow uh, carbon neutral, you would need to spend about 3% of your revenues, which is probably about you know, 15% of, <coughs> of, of your profit on buying carbon credits. And that's with carbon credits at a depressed price of $10 a ton. So it's fairly unattractive to the farmer. But actually, the farmer doesn't have to become carbon neutral. You know, we're not, we're not asking urban people to stop driving their cars. The farmer doesn't have to become carbon neutral. What the farmer has to do is, is not increase his greenhouse gas emissions. He has to offset growth. So if he grows his farming industry, which I understand you're planning to do here in Ireland, that only applies to the marginal growth in production. So if we, if we become Kyoto compliant, by which I mean, and, and say we've got ourselves 20% 20, 20 ahead of where we should be, well, we have to pay that on the marginal headroom, but that's, that may be only about 1% you know, of, of, of revenues. A lot more manageable. So that's cows. What about trees? Carbon forestry is the afforestation of non-forested land. In temperate countries, uh, annual sequestration from softwoods will be between 5 and 40 tonnes per hectare per year. And depending on whether you plant uh, um, short-lived softwoods like Pinus radiata or long-lived uh, species like uh, Sequoia or uh, Douglas fir, you can, you can get these gains for 20, 30, 40 or even 100 years. But once you've had those gains, a steady state will then ensue. The forest's carbon footprint will become steady state. You get no further gains once you have a lovely forest that's mature, sadly. So forestry is only a one-off a one gain to mankind, the afforestation of wastelands. It's not a perpetual gain. Putting cows and trees together. So imagine a, a regulatory or compliance uh, standard that required farmers or nations to limit net emissions. That is roughly how the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme has been designed to include agriculture, uh, although for political reasons it has not yet been extended to agriculture. So it's, it's, been, it's been approved by Parliament but not yet implemented. It's also how, in effect, the policy works here in Ireland. The individual farmer, unlike New Zealand, doesn't have any regulatory risk at this moment, but the, as a country, as I understand it, you, you've made certain commitments to how much greenhouse gases agriculture and a couple of other sectors can put off. So what's the solution? Well, the farmer or the farming nation can still grow production. However, they would need to build an offset mechanism. They could plant trees. And according to the mathematics on the previous slide, you'd be giving up around about 3 to 3 to 6% of milk revenues on the marginal investment in new capacity. What ratios are those? I'm going to skip this slide. It roughly works out that you'll need a quarter of a hectare of carbon forestry for each hectare of new, new, new dairying land. So if you can find some land in Donegal that won't grow dairy cows, that you can plant in trees, you need about 
for every four hectares of expanded dairy farming, you'll need about one hectare of secondary land. And, and putting it in numeric terms, if you were to buy that land uh, and forest it, and maybe the buying and the foresting cost you 10,000 10, euros a hectare, that would add about 8% to the capital cost, which is, which is a lot. But it's, you know, I think it's, it's workable. This, these are not impossible numbers for a society to attempt to achieve. The same numbers in New Zealand work out to about 4%. Slightly cheaper land, slightly more productive dairying. The ratio is about one hectare of farming land and half, we need, we need more forestry because this is quite an intensive dairying system, but we buy, the, we buy the forestry land a lot cheaper. You don't need to grow your carbon at home. It's actually possible to establish high yielding carbon forestry up to 50 or 60 tonnes in tropical regions. These countries have significant Cerrado grazing lands that are underutilised. There are major forestry afforestation programs going on in the Cerrado in the northeast of both Brazil and Colombia right now. And you can establish that forestry, acacia and other species, at around about $2,000 per hectare. In fact, we've done some forestry in New Zealand for about that amount. So at a 10% cost of capital, that would, that would throw off your carbon credits at about $5 per tonne which would lower the, those numbers I gave you earlier by about 60%. So you give up 3 to 6% of your revenues here in, in Ireland if you offset your carbon with forestry here in Ireland. If you go and do it in Latin America, you could do it for <coughs> one and a half to three euros, 3% uh, of revenues. I, I've only got two slides to go, and hopefully then I'll be almost on time. Um, Actually, I, this, is, this is a complete non sequitur. It's just a classic farming thing. I want to complain about something. And it is, I went down and I photographed in your spa on the high street down here in Dublin. So you're allowing these characters to sell that sugary water for 2.39 for two litres. And this afternoon I noticed milk being sold in your shops here for a pound, uh, euro 80. And, you know, as long as we do that, and uh, to me, as much as, as some of the other stuff we're discussing, that's the policy issue, that we have got ourselves in a very weak position with a, you know, I've got to believe that's a more valuable product on, on the left. And my, my last slide, really, is that I think another challenge that we have is, is the wrong type of government involvement. Agriculture is, is an afterthought in most countries. It's not an afterthought in, in, in Ireland, and it's not an afterthought in New Zealand. But... Um, there's quite a few countries where, where you're slightly embarrassed to say that you're a farmer when you go to dinner parties. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a forgotten industry. And, and we've priced ourselves right down at the bottom of, 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 of you know, the, 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 the commodity chains. And so because the stuff's so cheap, if we produce more of it, we don't get more demand. People eat the same amount irrespective of the price. Um, so we supply more and it just pushes prices down. Now, scientists and agribusiness people and policy people, of whom there'll be a number in this room, are mostly urban folk. They don't primarily care about farm income, and they talk a lot about the desirability of producing more food to feed the starving thousands. Um, and for the most part, they're very keen to roll out more technology and then you know, force us to sell cheap commodities and turn them into bad food. So that, that has been the story of, 20, of the last 100 years of agriculture. We've really got ourselves in a, quite a weak position. It caused a big glut in the 80s and 90s. Government with massive farmer pressure came to understand this in the 90s and decoupled subsidy from production. But my impression is we're starting to forget it again. And the same well-meaning uh, establishments are encouraging us to get government support for producing more food, which I think is going to be a mistake. And this is a complete non sequitur. If you think daring is hard, try red meat. So we discovered in the mathematics earlier that the, the greenhouse gas intensity of a, a, a kilogram of dry matter of milk is uh, about 10 kilograms of CO2. Uh, beef is around about 20. So it's, it's, a, it's a harder product to... Dairying, in my view, can quite easily be made environmentally acceptable through the numbers that we went through earlier. It's harder to make red meat environmentally acceptable. It's harder to, to offset, to buy enough forestry land to offset red meat, sadly, because my family has been red meat farming for 150 years. But, and, and when you go to the calorific content of the food, it's even worse because 
a kilogram of red meat has half the calories in it than a kilogram of, of milk dry matter. So we're talking about, we need to, for every calorie of food that we're delivering to the population, us red meat farmers need to, we're, we're four times behind the dairy farmer. That, that was a non sequitur. So uh, thank you very much. That was um, a slight jumble, but a, a few thoughts about you know, the environment and dairy farming.